NFL draft can't get here soon enough. Oh, we still got two weeks and two days before it does arrive. But it doesn't stop us from talking about it. John McMullen, Jody McDonald, Mac and Mac Bards 365. We got a draft expert to jump in with us from footballgameplan.com. Does work for CBS uh, HQ as well. Emery Hunt uh, joins us here on Birds 365. Uh, are you like us? You can't get the draft here quicker. You, 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 you put an X on the calendar every single day. Just get here already. Give us something that we can really sink our teeth into. How much looking forward to this draft are you, Emery? Well, I'm looking forward to it. But you got to remember, I'm football 365. So I've been engrossed in XFL stuff, getting ready for the USFL this upcoming weekend. Yeah. You're watching in XFL. You're, 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 oh, are, yeah. you, are you Mr. – you're the one. You're Mr. XFL. I didn't know one existed. Listen, man. Oh, St. Louis, man. They, they, those people love that team. The St. Here, Louis here's battle. what I, I don't get is that if we're doing draft stuff and all these scout reports that I put together, and I know a lot of these guys are not going to go to the NFL, it makes it more watchable to watch the alternate lease because you know all these guys. Okay. So I want to see what these dudes do out there on the field, getting their opportunity to play. So I am always involved in football. Uh, Emery, I see your jersey up in the background. Raging Cajuns. Uh, now, I know you used to play running back, so a couple questions. One, people in Philadelphia are going nuts about Bijan Robinson. I mean, they're not going to take him, but they think they're going to take him, but anybody who knows Howie Roseman knows. So it's a two-part question. Where where do you get, and not necessarily this trip, this trip, but also, you know, go back five, ten years, just how good is Bijan uh, as a prospect and as a former running back, you know, how do you feel about the NFL as a whole sort of devaluing the position over the past 10, 15 years? You know, uh, two great questions. And to attack the first one, uh, initially, yeah, I recently just compiled my running back rankings from 2020 to this year's class. And Bijan were ranked third behind Jameer Gibbs and uh, DeAndre Ooh. Swift. I was a big DeAndre Swift fan coming out so still to say third with an 85 grade in my in my rankings is pretty high because Bijan to me is a really good terrific all-around back he's a three down guy you can leave him out there he's a great downfield threat in the passing game not just one of these meets expectations running backs that catches swing screens flares and flats you're supposed to do that you can send him downfield in the route and he'll be excellent the reason why I like Jameer Gibbs better because he does all of those things just a little bit more explosive and a little bit more dynamic. Um, so for me, whether they take Bijan or Gibbs could kind of help make this offense even faster. It, it doesn't really matter to me because I feel like they can't go wrong if they go running back at one of these picks. Uh, but I feel like with two picks in the first round, with the way they've compiled their roster, they're sitting pretty sweet in, in any direction they go in. And to answer your second question, I just find that these people talk out of both sides of their mouth because they'll say, oh, you don't take a running back high. These guys don't last long. Uh, you don't give them a second contract. Their best value is when they first come into the league as rookies. Well, would that make sense to take them in the first round? Because you get them at their youngest, at their best, yeah. at their most explosive, and you get the fifth-year option, and you can decide after the year, after year five if you want to extend them or if you just want to go back into the draft and draft another one in the first and round. The next one, yeah. and, 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 not a, and not everybody is a first-round back. You know, there's a difference between Barry Sanders and myself. There's a difference between <laughs> the jokes in the chat, Brian Westbrook, and myself, right? So you want to take the guy that can put the ball in the paint early, very much so, and often. Um, so there's a difference between – I saw some Saints fans uh, talking about this before. Well, you know, you don't really need a Reggie Bush because you can get Alfred Morris. What? Like, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> All right, let me ask you about the third of the triumvirates of backs, and I think these are the top three, and then there's a bit of a drop-off, um, and that's Zach Charbonnet from uh, UCLA. I'm a big fan of his, and specifically for the Eagles, because I think of the three, he's the best between the tackles runner. I think he's got the capability to bounce it outside and uh, go around the corner and make big plays, maybe not as many as the other two backs, but I do like his combination of skills, and I think it's a better fit with the Eagles. How highly do you rate Zach Charbonnet? He's someone that I would value in that third, fourth round range. Um, I like him as a player. He reminds me a lot of James Conner 
So if you look at the way the Eagles depth chart is constructed, you can probably say, okay, he can fill that role. But you kind of ask yourself, do you already have that in what Rashad Penny will potentially bring to the table? I know Rashad Penny has the health issues, but even with you comparing both backs, Penny is much more explosive. He can, he has the ability to hit the home run and that's what Charbonnet lacks. Charbonnet is more, and it's not a, a one-to-one comparison. I'm just talking about how, you know, when you look at the James Conner, when you look at a, a Jordan Howard, these are guys that are kind of more along the lines of your four minute offense guys, your pace setters. Now where I feel like Charbonnet has some success is that he does have better footwork than Connor. Um, so he does have the ability to read front side to back side. I like his vision. Uh, he just doesn't have that second gear or even that third gear to really rip that long run. But when you look at the depth chart of Philly, you kind of say, okay, can we bank on a healthy Rashad Penny? And do we have someone maybe, is he better than Kennedy Brooks? That's the other question that you're going to find these guys kind of going through throughout this whole draft process. But the player itself, uh, Charbon, I, I am a big fan of. Uh, the running game as a whole, Emery, and I want to bring Jalen Hurts in the conversation for this reason. Um, you know, Nick Sirianni talked about it uh, last year. I think his quote was, uh, front side wins games, backside wins championships. When you have a quarterback like Jalen Hurts that can pull the football, does that make it easier for a running back uh, in general? Absolutely. And I've said I've been on this position since, you know, 2009. When you have a, a guy that is mobile, it enhances your run game. You can even go back to Tim Tebow, right? And people love to bank on Tebow. But when he was in Denver, guess who had the beneficiary of seeing advantageous boxes? It was Willis McGahee. You know what I'm saying? And so to me, if you have those guys, CJ2K wasn't CJ2K with any other quarterback outside of Vince Young. He was CJ2K with Vince Young. He was CJ1300 with everybody else, right? <laughs> you look at Michael Vick compared with Warwick Dunn, had his best yards per carry in his career, had his highest season total rushing. It makes it better. So when you have a, a dynamic quarterback that's um, a plus one in the run game paired with a great back, the numbers could be ridiculous. That's why Eagles fans are excited about the potential of a B. John Robinson or Jameer Gibbs. They can see a potentially 2,000-yard rusher if you pair up one of these explosive backs. Now, to quickly, to quickly piggyback off that, Emery, so I want you to put on your GM hat. If you're a GM, and this isn't the traditional um, you know, play action quarterback drop back quarterback that needs a significant running game that needs a Adrian Peterson type that can, you know, run the football is, does that affect your thought process saying, Hey, I can get the production I need from a second or a third round back because of my quarterback. And I can go get an edge rusher or a top tier left tackle. Does that affect your thinking as far as how you're building the entire roster? It depends on which back are we talking about. Are we talking about Zach Charbonnet in round three, or are we talking about someone that has the potential to go 90 yards on any given carry, right? And, and so that's the difference. It's the difference between a Barry Sanders and whoever was backing up Barry Sanders. I think it was Gerald Moore or somebody, right? That's the difference. And if you're Philly, you can also even take it a step further. Do we need someone uh, as a slot receiver? I know Quez Watkins is trying to make his hay in, in that position. Can we get the you know the same thing from a guy in the slot, which is why when you look at one of these backs, let's say a Jameer Gibson or even a B. John Robinson, can serve that role too. So, yes, you have to look at your team, how it's constructed, how much of a drop-off do we have from um, Kenneth Gainwell you know, to the guy that we could potentially draft in round one. And when you look at, okay, we got a good running game now. Where else on the team do we lack? Do we need a standout pass rusher, a young guy that can really get after it? Are we high enough to go and get a Will Anderson, who I think is the next Terrell Suggs? Or do we look at someone, I know Eagles fans probably have been crying for this, um, and they haven't really done it. I know they have N'Kobe Dean, but, man, I'd be hard-pressed to pass up on a, a Deion Henley late in the first round because of what he does. Remind me a lot of Fred Warner. They can also go cornerback. So they have to look at their roster and decide, is it like a scale? Where are we, you know, kind of 
lean? Where can we use an, an elite guy? And where can we get better? Right now, running back does seem like a luxury, but it would be hard to, to pass up on guys that can ring that cash register up quickly like a Bijan or a Jameer Gibbs. If there is a position that the Eagles, somewhat like the rest of the National Football League, but maybe even a little bit more so, have devalued, the only one that's been devalued more than running back is linebacker. So, it, it, Johnny and I keep saying, they're not going to take a running back at 10. They're not going to take a run. They are not going to take a linebacker at 10. That's no chance, no shot, no how, no way. That's just the way that the Eagles look at the value of the position. So, instead, I want to go to that. You, you touch on a couple names. The edge uh, guys who are available in this draft. If we put Will Anderson and Tyree Wilson to the side, that they will go before we ever get to the 10 pick in the draft, and I think they both will. Next three guys, Lucas Van Ness, Nolan Smith, and for me, Miles Murphy of Clemson. I had them as the next three edge guys. Some people may have them in a specific order. I want you to put them in the order of how they best fit the Eagles. And if that's, hey, Jody, here's the way they rank. Here's the way you got to plug them in for the Eagles too. Van Ness, Smith, Murphy. How do you rank those three edge guys if the Eagles are going to take an edge guy at 10? I would probably rank them Smith Mur uh, and Murphy and Van Ness probably tied. I like the versatility of Van Ness. Uh, he has shown that he can rush over the guard, which is cool. You know, it gives you a, a unique NASCAR package. Um, mm -hmm. I like Murphy's ability. He has been productive over the course of years. But Smith, to me, has elite level clothes. Um, and that's the ability to see the ball carrier, see the quarterback going away and just quickly hit that accelerator and close with that length that he has to make the play. I would also throw in a guy, if you can't get one of those three guys, I would also throw in uh, Villamy Fihoku out of San Jose State. He has the energy and the explosiveness off the edge uh, that, that I just see yielding itself positively to Philly's defense. But if you talk about the specific three that you mentioned, Nolan Smith, to me, uh, would give them exactly what they want. Uh, pressure. I know that's an all Georgia defense, you know, but <laughs> they, they, uh, they, it's where they don't mind it at this <laughs> point. It would surprise uh, me to see them end up with Jalen Carter, too. So that yeah. could be on the table. Well, that's what you know, we don't know, none of us know where teams are when it comes to the off the field stuff with Jalen Carter. But from your standpoint, Emery, just as a pure football player, um, where does he rank for you? in this draft in sort of that is he in the blue chip category still after showing up a little bit out of shape could have been the stress from everything else going on um yeah. could have been a lot of reasons the film looks really good um to me he was the best player in the draft is he still the best player in the draft i, I agree too many players say he's the best player in the draft but i will say he's definitely worth a, a top 10 pick put it that way, and uh, can definitely help your defense out right away. And I agree with you. I think when you're dealing with life situations, it, that that really can bother you, which is why I'm also high on Brian Brissy out of Clemson, another guy that dealt with life issues all throughout last season. In addition to coming back from an injury, he's still a blue chip prospect in my eyes, just like Carter is. And so, again, it's a good draft, um, especially if you need – someone on the interior both offensive line and defensive line carter has shown that he can rush the passer he can be disruptive in the run game and he can fill a void uh playing next to his former teammate in, in um jordan davis in addition to getting that rotational uh work behind uh you know a guy in fletcher cox that has been stellar since he's been in philly uh so yeah i i still would take carter pretty high and, and so um, the conspiracy theory theorist in me thinks that Philly is the one that planted the seed to, you know, drop oh, the story yeah. at the combine when the defensive tackles were our defensive line were going to speak at the podium and puts them right in position to where he can fall to where, where they're, they're in striking distance to go up a couple spots to go and get them. Love when our guests put conspiracy theories out there that involve the Philadelphia Eagles. It makes our job easier. Um, I, I know it doesn't have a direct impact on the Eagles, but as a tangential uh, impact on the Eagles, the quarterbacks. Um, 
different people have different rankings of who should be ranked where and where what kind of grades they should be getting. And we know quarterbacks are oftentimes overdrafted. How good a quarterback class is this in your mind? Uh, is there a legit debate about who should be number one, Stroud or Young? How do you grade the quarterbacks that are in this year's draft, Emery? This class reminds me so much of 2017's class. And in 2017 class, I had the three guys clustered as, you know, the, as guys I would take in the first round. Uh, Watson, Mahomes, and Deshaun Kaiser in that order. This And I all had them with the same grade. So in this year's class, I have Richardson, number one, Bryce Young, number two, C.J. Stroud, number three, but all with the same grade. And then behind those guys, I strongly feel like this is a good year uh, for teams to really – either get a a solid QB2 with that that has potential uh QB1 upside it, just like 2017 I want to say my fifth quarterback fourth quarterback in that class I had I was big fan of Gerard Evans out of Virginia Tech fifth guy was CJ uh PJ Walker um I wasn't as high on Trubisky and in this class I, I'm not as high on Will Levis uh, but there are guys within this draft class that I think can be solid QB2s and have that Taylor Heineke type, hey, let's get him in there and let him start. And then he proves to be a solid player for them that they could win some games or like a Sam Howell. Um, this this is a really good class. And I know people poo-poo on, you know, the, the guys at the top and, you know, they constantly want to change. But, man, people have to understand how now, well, since COVID, since 2020, how valuable your backup quarterback is because your starter will miss a game or two. You yeah. better have well, someone that's competent. Yeah. Uh, Tell San Francisco in the NFC Championship game. You know, you start losing quarterbacks, uh, you're in deep trouble. Um, Hendon Hooker is a guy who was interesting to me because he's older. You mentioned COVID. That's part of it. You, you have some older prospects now uh, because of what went on. He's, I think he's 25. So, you know, who knows? He might not even be on the field till he's 26 or 27. Do you think he's a first round talent? Do you think he's a first round pick? Um, where do you have Hendon Hooker? You know, I, I don't think he's a first round talent. And um I, I, I would feel comfortable with him <clears throat> in the second round. And, and here's why, because you touched on it. And I can't wait till we get back to normal eligibility yeah. in years. Um, because as a draft analyst, it's hard to know who's coming out, who's going to take advantage of their sixth year of college football and, you know, seventh year of college football. Um, but when you look at now what's happening on the back end, you're getting guys that are 24, 25, 26 year old rookies. And for quarterbacks, I know that's different. I know it's unique. <clears throat> you don't have to think everybody can play until they're 40, but not everybody plays well late past 35, like Tom Brady did. Right. Yeah. Um, so when you look at Hendon Hooker, and this is how I would do it if I'm in the draft room for a team specifically like the Raiders. You know, if you're out of that top three where well, you're not going to get Richardson, Young, or Stroud, don't force a Will Levis at seven. Take a position player, take the best cornerback out there, and then in round two, get a guy like Hendon Hooker that can come in and play right now because what you're getting with these guys that are 24, 25 years old, like a Jaron Hall, you know, like a Adrian Martinez, guys that have played a lot of football, they're 25, 20, you know, 24, 25 years old. Plop them in there right now with a solid team around them, and they should be able to at least keep this offense or this team afloat to where it puts you in contention to probably get us one of these last playoff spots. So I, the older prospects, you kind of knock them down because of the, the upside potential. They're, they're probably at their ceiling. And when you factor in him coming off of an ACL injury, I know it's a knee, but not everybody returns like Adrian Peterson, right? Yeah. So every knee injury is different, and it's a psychological thing mostly. So I think if I'm a team that has a spot for, let's say, a, a Minnesota Vikings in the second round, would make sense because you still have Kirk Cousins. You're not pressed to push, push Hinton Hooker out there. It makes sense to get a guy that's able to step in and, and play right now um, instead of someone that you need to have to develop. Just remember Jake Hayner. I've been saying this guy for two years. Jake now. Hayner. Love, love yeah. the kid. He's going to be a day three pick. He'll he'll eclipse a Taylor Heineke. He'll actually get a chance to start more games than Taylor Heineke does. 
but uh, I know he's a day three pick, but he just I, I love he's the a gamer. Play. He's I will say this. He's a gamer. Yep. Um, and you saw this down at uh, the senior bowl in the 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 drills all throughout the week. He, he didn't do well. But when they the last day of practice, which was that Thursday before they had the Friday walkthrough Thursday, they did game like situations where they did full team drills and driving down the field in two minutes. He excelled. So it tells you. He doesn't practice well, but he plays the game well. So he'll do great in a game situation. And I'm glad you brought up Heineke because that's a really good comparison. To, uh, hey, some guys may not practice like, you know, look good in shorts. But when it's time to really lock in and, and win these game situations, that's where Hayner tends to perform well. And that's what you need out of your backup quarterback. Come in. We're, we're not going to ask you. We're not going to overexpose you. We need you to come in off the bench, keep a lead, be able to win one game for maybe two most and get your quarterback back. Jay Kaner is going to be that kind of player in the NFL. All right. I got to ask you about the other skill position, and that's wide receiver. Eagles have Devontae, and they've got A.J. Brown. So they're not looking for a guy who's going to step in and get 70 catches as a rookie or maybe even the next two or three years, because both of those guys are locked up with contracts. But I think they could use an upgrade at wide receiver three. The Eagles are in three wide receivers, what, Johnny Mack, 70% of the time? Uh, a little bit less. They play more 12 than most people, but everybody plays a ton of 11. So you need a, you need a third receiver in the NFL, no question about it. How good is this draft, wide receiver-wise, top to bottom, depth, uh, is this a wide receiver draft where you can get someone late day two or some point day three? If the Eagles, we know the Eagles will be drafting a wide receiver. The question is where and when, and how good a draft is this for them to potentially catch lightning in a bottle? I think it's really good. Uh, again, just really studying these guys deeply or in depthly um, because I break these receivers down into four positions split in your X receiver, your Z receiver, your slot receiver, and what I like to call bigger inside receiver, which is the Marcus Colston position. Um, and looking across the board, it's a very good uh, group of receivers. So, yes, you don't have to take one in round one. You can get one in on day two. But when you look at Philly, man, and you think about creating problems, again, that's why I said Philly with two first-round picks can really go anywhere, right? I know they have other needs, and you guys touched on wide receiver being not necessarily a, a, a significant need, but no. definitely they want to improve the wide receiver three. It, it, would you take Jackson Smith and Jigba to step in right there as your slot receiver? Yeah, but you're, yeah, no, in the first round, no. Second yeah, but, round, no. And and he's going to be gone well before that. So I think you got to take him out of the conference. I'm a big fan, and I don't think there's any way the Eagles are going to they, – they'll have the ability to take him. I just don't think they'll use a first-round pick on him. You don't think Njigba is going to fall into the second round, do you? I'm not talking about the second round. I'm talking about one of those two first-round picks if, yeah. if the situation uh, right. presented itself. You also have Zay Flowers. You also have Jordan Addison. You have guys that can win one-on-one -on -one matchups that you want to pick uh, that you want to put in in the inside and have that success, create that void. It all depends on how explosive you want this offense to be. It was what, the number one, number two offense in the NFL already? Or do you double down and use both of these picks on defensive players or point of attack players, D-line, O-line, you know, just to build that depth and continuity. Uh, but for me, when you're talking about the receiver class, like I said, it's deep going across the board. It's just about what type of receiver they want to fill. I think they'll focus on that slot position. Yep. And based on what the slot position has done in college football and how we normally see four wide receiver sets, sometimes empty uh, more often than not, we're going to see a bevy of guys at all the different positions um, at receiver <laughs> that can play uh, a significant role early in the NFL. So give me a slot guy, not someone who's going to get drafted in the first or second round, Third round or earliest, or maybe even later, a guy might be a little underrated, under the radar, a good slot receiver who will be available in the third round or later. Let's talk about, uh, i give you a, you want a big slot or you want a small slot? Which one? What would you say, Johnny? Do you think they would I, 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 I want a small slot because I'm going to ask you a question after this about a potential big slot. So, uh, <laughs> All right. Let's go small slot. Let's say Josh Downs out of North Carolina is there in round two. He is someone I think will be there uh, 
within striking distance for Philadelphia, maybe in that mm-hmm. mid-second round range. He's from North Carolina. Um, I've always said this. You give someone like that with that level of quickness and elite speed and, and, and burst a two-way go, it's curtains. He's he's It's over for you. Um, so for me, when you think about what they've built on – the outside with guys that can win above the rim and Smith and also Brown. Um, you want someone that can do that much damage across the middle. I think Josh Downs can be that guy in North Carolina, a small slot. Nice. Uh, okay. Last one from me, Emery. And before I get to it, make sure you follow him uh, at F ball game plan on Twitter. You hear the tremendous knowledge he has about the NFL draft. Uh, footballgameplan.com your 2023 draft guide is out so people can order that make sure you do it i i want to go outside the box and i'll give my friend dave zangaro credit for this because he mentioned it yesterday on the show and i said "Hmm, that that piqued my interest the eagles need an upgrade as jody mentioned that's sort of that third receiver not really their fourth receiver because dallas goddard is their third receiver why not? I just mentioned they play more 12 personnel than most teams. And they love Georgia players now. We, we're talking about them all. Right? They might get Jalen Carter. They might get Nolan Smith. Last year was Jordan Davis, Nicobe Dean. Darnell Washington, the tight end from Georgia. If you have Dallas Goddard can play in line. He's a great blocker. If you have a kid like that who was so athletic as a flex receiver and you have A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith on the field, what do you do? What What are your thoughts on, on, on Darnell White, who didn't play a lot because George is so good, but he's got so much athletic talent, so many gifts from a size, a matchup standpoint, just your general thoughts on him. I feel like he's one-dimensional. I feel like he's with the Colts have, and they're big tight end that they drafted last year, Jelani Woods out of Virginia. Um, but that one Re- dimension is receiving, right? The, the, I think no? he's just a big. I think he's just a big guy playing against 18, 19 year olds, which is why right. Brock Bowers was their dynamic duo. Oh yeah, well end. he's tremendous. He's so a, I yeah. feel like if you take a Washington, if if and you know I think Washington is really good in a run game. That would allow you to put Dallas Goddard, kick him in more of a right. flex right. H-back position and allow him to run routes because he's a better route runner than Washington. He's a better receiver than Washington. Now, Washington can then kick out wide as your red zone threat um, because he's big. Uh, but in terms of like doing a lot of the things that Dollar, uh, Dallas Goddard does, I think Goddard is a much well-rounded player than Washington is. But Washington would still give you the, what you want in a run game. Uh, with the seam of uh, flexibility because he's such a big guy going down the middle of the field, also can be as a you know jump ball guy inside of the red zone. But I feel like um, someone like Sam Laporta of Iowa would be a better fit um, for from a dynamic standpoint because now you have two route runners essentially um, that have blocking experience uh, right there at tight end. But Washington, if you're expecting him to be you know, uh, Jimmy Graham, I, I, I don't think that's his game. All right, last one for me. Um, last year with the Eagles, they got off to a phenomenal start in turning other teams over. It's got a lot of turnovers, kind of petered out in the second half, probably due to C.J. Gardner-Johnson's injury. Uh, they just didn't turn teams over, and the coach likes to talk about uh, chunk plays and avoiding chunk plays and getting turnovers and the like. I want to ask about a very specific kid, Emmanuel Forbes from Mississippi State. <laughs> Eagles had him in as a draft visit guy, six pick sixes in his career at Mississippi State. Talk about turnovers, taking it to the house with a turnover or something everybody on the planet wants, and you just can't project. Though. You, you can say he did it, but you can't say he'll do it as soon as he gets to pros. Eagles brought him in. Uh, they're going to take uh, some secondary help at some point. It's not going to be with either the 10th or the 30th, just my opinion. How good a player is he? Do you think he can do the type of things he did at Mississippi State in the NFL? What, what ball skills like that shows you, um, it shows you a guy. And it's different than – remember the safety Louisville had, I want to say, 
probably about eight years ago that had like 13 interceptions his last season at Louisville. Um, but a lot of really, yeah, he did. Wow, and, how do I not remember uh, that? that? 13, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's, that's an ungodly point. number. Yeah. Well, here's why because he wasn't the best athlete, he wasn't fast, and a lot of those interceptions came off tips, and he just happened to be in the right spot, right? Yeah. Okay. But Forbes, that's not the case. Forbes does show the high level football instincts, twitch, and IQ to really turn the ball over. And he actually does a great job when he's playing off coverage. So now if you're thinking about it from a defensive standpoint, you can press on one side and have him sit off on the inside uh, on the other side of the field and dare you to throw that quick slant, dare you to throw that bang eight, dare you to throw that, that dagger out. He's going to jump it. He's going to turn it over. And like you mentioned, he's going to bring it back the other way. So, Obviously, everyone focuses on his weight, you know, him being 166. But when you watch him play, he's throwing that 166 in the run game and blowing stuff up, too. So nice. and I'm not worried about weight. You're going to be able to gain weight. There's enough cheesesteaks in Philly to help him yeah. with that. Right. So I'm not worried about him being 166. I love the instincts. I want to see him get better and much more confident with his hands because he does have the length. And he has to know that, hey, I'm a long guy. I have to use it consistently at the pro level to be able to play more bump press coverage. But when you're playing him off, it, adjacent to someone that's playing press, quarterback's going to have a problem. Yeah. yeah, I'm not going to worry about his weight because just two years ago, I remember being Devontae, a, yeah. yeah. Devontae, Devontae Smith, look at those toothpicks for legs. How the <laughs> hell is he going to stay upright? In the By the way, uh, Emery, I, I – agree with Jody. I now don't care about it because I've watched Devontae, but Devontae's exactly. special. Um, he does have toothpicks for life. It's amazing. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it is amazing. And he's really a physical player. Uh, but to your point, I just I don't think he's he not can afraid to throw his 166 pounds into the mix and make tackles. Yeah. That's what you want to hear about a 166 yeah. pound guy. I don't think he can gain weight. So at, at, actually real quick, Kalijah Kansi, same size thing. Um, I, he's such a unique player. I don't think it's fair to compare anybody to Aaron Donald, but obviously the pit comparisons. Um, how high do you think he could go? Because I've seen wild, you know, everywhere from 10, the Eagles to, you know, mid-20s. Uh, where, where do you think his range should be? I think his range should be round two. Um, oh, because we kind of love the the quick flash of the you know quick pressure getting the backfield to make a play. But when you watch these guys on a down to down basis, and, and you see how they handle duo blocks, combo blocks, getting off blocks, uh, that's only going to ratchet up as you get to the pro level. Uh, I feel like he could be a good situational guy, good NASCAR Packers guy, because he can. He even has some ability to rush on the outside. So, but you're talking if you're taking him high, you're expecting him to be that down to down guy up front. I don't think that's where his skill set is from a consistency standpoint, from a point of attack strength standpoint. Um, that makes him different than Aaron Donald to in, in that regard. Um, so I think his range should be round two. I know he tested well. I know he ran fast, all that good stuff. Uh, but just from a pure functional strength standpoint, he has to improve there, which in my book will slide him down to round two. Emery, great stuff. We appreciate you coming on. We're running a bit a little bit late. Between you and me, we could probably do 25 more minutes with you if we had it. Thank you very much for jumping in with us today. We'll get you on after the draft. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you having me. Thanks, Emery. Emery Hunt from game plan, uh, footballgameplan.com. Uh, you can catch him on CBS HQ as well. All right, J-Mac, J-Mac, coming back. We got to put a bow on the show here on Bird Street 65.